few years ago, more than a few years ago now, Stephanie and I went to Granada in southern Spain. While we were there, we visited the Alhambra, the royal palace and fort complex that once housed the capital of the Moorish territory of Al-Andalus. In one of the palatial courtyards, there is a fountain surrounded by 12 stone lions. The story goes that the fountain was built as a clock, that these ingenious Andalusian architects uh, designed it so that water would pour forth from the mouth of a different lion at each hour. When the Spaniards conquered Granada, they were amazed by this advanced engineering, and they took this fountain apart to see how it worked. After detailed investigation, they remained completely baffled. So they just put it back together just as they disassembled it. But it never worked again. Jesus' parables are frequently enigmatic, kind of like that fountain. They're simple stories, but stories that do complex work. The temptation is often to read these parables as allegories, uh, stories where one, every element uh, has a specific meaning, you know, fables meant to convey a moral point, a single moral point. We try to understand these parables by taking them apart, trying to figure out how they work uh, to get a better idea of their plumbing. But we may end up losing or missing what makes them really special. Parables are generally neither allegories nor fables. They don't have simple meanings or singular points that they're trying to make. They're more like divine jokes. Jokes play with our expectations and surprise us in order to entertain us. Like jokes, I think parables are often excuse me, intended to be entertaining, even funny. Jesus isn't talking to scholars or debating with lawyers here. He's talking with blue-collar people using language they would use with one another in their everyday conversations. It makes sense that in order to connect with them, he would use jokes and parables. When parables make us laugh, we consider them harmless, and we allow them past our defenses and our prejudices where they can present new ideas that we might not otherwise accept. But, of course, to explain a joke or a parable is to kill it, to suck the life out of it. You all know that telling someone why a joke is funny only makes it less funny. And yet, in order to get Jesus' joke, we have to understand it. That's why my job today is so ironic. The sermon is supposed to help us understand this parable, but if I explain it, I'm going to kill it. Isn't that funny? When Jesus originally told these stories to people, he used ideas and images that would have been very familiar to them. For example, when Jesus told these seed parables, he was speaking to a, fee to a people very familiar with farming. Even if they themselves didn't farm, there were farmers all around. They were in the midst of farm fields and shepherd's fields. Um, they, live, they knew how to tell when grain was ripe, and they knew what happened when the grain was ripe. They knew that no one in their right mind would intentionally sow mustard anywhere because it grew wild everywhere, and anywhere it grew, it spread like, like wildfire. They also know that mustard does not, it, while it does grow very large, it could hardly be called the greatest of all shrubs. And it is certainly not a place in which birds build their nests. These twists are the punchline of the parable. But without understanding the way the parable plays with those expectations, the punchline just sails right over our heads. And that's why we hear a little bit of Ezekiel today. The reading comes from a much longer poem that is itself a parable of sorts. As Ezekiel tells uh, a story as a comment on the political situation of his own time. In this parable, he uses a well-established uh, image for God's kingdom, a cedar. Now, Pacific Northwesterners know a lot about cedars. They're tall, lovely trees with beautiful wood. Lebanon, just north of Israel, was renowned for its abundant, high-quality cedar forests. When King Solomon built his first temple, 
He constructed it using cedar lumber from Lebanon. Ezekiel, Daniel, Isaiah, and Zechariah all use tall, majestic cedar trees to represent the righteousness of God and God's chosen kingdom, Israel. Especially in this parable of Ezekiel's, this image is repeated of a small shoot of cedar being taken and planted, eventually growing into a majestic tree, the way all plants grow. The growth is understood to be the work of God, as is the image of the birds taking refuge in its branches. All the way back in Genesis, God explains that God has chosen to set Abraham and his descendants aside to be a blessing to the world. A cedar blessed by God to grow tall and strong that blesses the birds of the air with its safety. So, okay, great, we get it. The cedar represents God's kingdom, right? Starts off small, grows into something big for the benefit of the whole world. Mustard does the same thing, right? That must be exactly the point. Well, not quite. See, when Jesus begins talking about God's kingdom like being a plant sprouting, his original Jewish audience may have began to think back to Ezekiel and to these other prophets and to expect him to talk about God's kingdom, Israel, as a noble cedar. Instead, Jesus says, God's kingdom is like the noble and mighty mustard weed. It starts out small, but it grows into the greatest of pernicious vegetables. When I say it that way, you can start to see the humor, right? Right? Jesus' language about the kingdom of God and the tallest of trees and the birds nesting in the branches cause us to expect a cedar. But instead, we're given the image of a common weed. It begins to make us wonder. I wonder, if the cedar is Israel, what's the mustard seed? Is it Israel or is it something else? If God's kingdom isn't Israel, then, well, then what is it? If the power of kingdoms is symbolized by the strength and the height of trees, is the kingdom of God even a kingdom at all? These are all questions that Jesus' parable might raise, questions that if he simply asked might make us defensive or confused. But wrapped in this little parable, this little joke about a weed, they just entertain us. And then they cause us to ask what might otherwise be very dangerous questions. So now I've ruined the joke for you. You're welcome. We can take it apart like the lion fountain and analyze it until we're blue in the face and we'll only get less funny. But maybe with some appreciation of the background, we can still learn something from it. Of course, it's not just the past that helps us understand the joke, but also the future. The best part of this divine joke is not the punchline, but who's telling it? When Ezekiel originally told his story, the noble cedar represented the royal lineage of David. The tender shoot plucked from the top was the current king. Earlier in the chapter, Ezekiel describes how the cedar shoot is plucked by an eagle, representing the king of Babylon, and then taken into exile. But in the story we read today, God takes the tippy-top cedar shoot and plants it on Mount Zion, In Jerusalem, Ezekiel uses the image as a promise of restoration for Israel and that through restoration, God's blessings are poured out on the whole world. Well, as we know, Jesus is David's royal heir, God's promised Messiah. He's, in a sense, the very restoration that Ezekiel imagined half a millennium earlier. But just like that surprising mustard bush in this parable, He's not what people expected. The noble cedars of his time saw him as the invasive weed in God's perfectly ordered garden. They planted him on a hill, all right, didn't they? He sprouted from the ground and put forth his branches, but not at all in the way Ezekiel imagined. But you know what? In spite of that, in spite of the fact that none of this happened the way that it was supposed to, In his death, God's blessing was spread to the whole world. Funny how that works, isn't it? Under his outstretched arms, we come to find life and safety. The people who were waiting for a cedar found a mustard bush, so they cut it down. 
Now, when you cut down a cedar, that's it, right? No more cedar. But do you know what happens when you pull out a mustard bush? Some years ago, the folks from a local congregation in Pullman, Washington, decided to plant some mustard in the community garden uh, in honor of this uh, parable. They selected a corner apart from the other herbs and vegetables to plant their mustard seeds, not even knowing if they would sprout. Well, sprout they did, and they did indeed grow into grand little shrubs. And then they kept growing. The gardeners spent all summer fighting and wrestling with this mustard to keep it from spreading beyond its allotted corner. It was with great relief that that fall they finally pulled up all the old plants and tilled the entire garden under to be ready for the next year. But then next spring, before they had a chance to plant any new crops, before the snow was scarcely off the ground, do you know what they found? The entire garden plot was nothing but mustard. (laughs) That's the joke, I think. Cedars are tall and noble, but they can be cut down. Mustard is nothing special. It's like scotch broom or blackberry brambles or shotweed, which I learned recently, by the way, is actually a type of mustard. You can eat the leaves just like you can mustard greens. I've not tried grinding up the seeds and mixing with vinegar, but... Anyway... Once it shows up, it's there to stay. If God's kingdom, if in God's kingdom, death only encourages new life, what does that say to us when we encounter death and suffering in our own lives? If Jesus is the nasty weed in the well-ordered garden, what does that say about the people we'd like to uproot from our own community? If the noble cedars in charge of our country and our economy are not what God's kingdom looks like, then where do we look to see God at work? We may not be able to explain Jesus' little joke about seeds, but we don't really have to. They take root and grow in us. We know not how. They keep creeping into our vacant lots and our highway medians. Every time we see shotweed or scotch broom or blackberries, we can think about God's kingdom and be reminded of the ways it's always there, sometimes unnoticed, until all of a sudden we realize that everything else has been pushed out to make way for God's gentle reign of justice and peace, even when it looks like exactly the contrary. And in that reign of justice and peace, There will be plenty of spicy mustard and blackberry jam for everyone. (laughs) And when that harvest comes, we'll know to grab our sickles and get to work.